So I'm Sue Minkoff. I'm an associate professor of mathematics at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. And I'm involved in the um, MIRTH NSF Engineering Research Center that we are part of at UMBC. And I'm a mathematician working on mathematical modeling of trace gas sensors. So MIRTH stands for Mid-Infrared Technologies for Health and the Environment. And it's an engineering research center funded by the National Science Foundation that's headquartered out of Princeton University. There's an electrical engineering professor there, Claire Gamakal, who is the lead PI on the center. <clears throat> and then there are a number of universities involved. So uh, UMBC is one of the universities, um, Johns Hopkins, Rice, Texas A&M, and City College of New York, along with Princeton. And so. Um, there are a number of different things that the MIRTH Center is working on. One is to develop quantum cascade lasers, which is um, a big part of what the, the PI at Princeton is interested in. And then a second avenue is sensor modeling, sensor design using those lasers, potentially. And then uh, finally, applications of the sensors. These trace gas sensors, which is the part that I'm involved in, are used um, for a variety of applications. Um, there are environmental applications, there are health and medical applications, there are industrial applications and homeland security applications. And basically the idea is you want to be able to detect um, small amounts of gases, so what are called trace gases. And um, one of the big applications, the one that Johns Hopkins is mostly interested in, is for disease diagnosis. So if you have a disease like um, liver disease, the chemical composition of your breath changes. There would be more ammonia in your breath, say. But these, you know, your breath is complicated. It's got a, a lot of different chemicals in it. And so it's just a, a small change in the amount of that particular gas that you would see. Or if you're interested in detecting whether someone has lung cancer, um, the chemical composition of your breath would change. They want to understand the sensors. They understand from a physical perspective, an engineering perspective, you know, what they're seeing in the lab. They can run experiments, but they want to be able to predict, you know, how the sensors will work, how effective they'll be in certain environments, how to make the sensors be the most effective, and that's where mathematicians come in. If mathematicians can come up with a model, a mathematical model, that they can simulate the process that the sensors follow um, on a computer, then it's, it's a way to make predictions and to improve on that device. And so that's what we're doing. We were trying to help um, the people at Rice who are building the sensors understand them better and try to um, make sure that they work as well as they possibly can. But the primary work that I'm talking about, the modeling and the optimization, was done in collaboration with Dr. John Sweck, whose faculty at UMBC were right outside his office, and primarily by the graduate student Noemi Petra, who is now a postdoc at the University of Texas. Um, and she really did this work. So we advised her, but she came up with the model, she did the numeric, she, she did the optimizations. The idea of the sensor is that there's a laser that would be um, would shine in in this direction into the into the paper, so the y direction, and you see it um, would be centered at this red dot, and you shine the laser in, and the idea is that you're trying to detect some particular kind of gas. So let's say you're trying to detect carbon dioxide, and we're most interested in small amounts of these gases, trace gases. You're not interested in being in a room that's 100% carbon dioxide. You want you know, a small amount of the gas. And if you send the laser light in at the right frequency, certain gases absorb certain frequencies of light and so, or wavelengths. So the idea is that you send the laser light in at the right frequency to um, be absorbed by carbon dioxide, the carbon dioxide molecules absorb that, that energy, they get excited, and um, what we model is a, a, a tiny little thermal wave that occurs due to the heating of the gas molecules by the laser light. And so there's a little thermal wave that propagates out from that red dot, and it heats up the sides, the inner sides of these tines of the tuning fork. So you're not shining the laser light on the quartz. The tuning fork here is quartz. You're actually using the excitement of the gas molecules 
to cause a thermal wave that will then heat up the sides of the tuning fork. And so that temperature causes a stress and a deformation and the tuning fork tines bend. So this sensor has a couple of components. One is a laser. Another is a, a small quartz tuning fork like the one you've got in your watch. And um, when the tines of the tuning fork deform, and the tuning fork vibrates, if you have electrodes on the tuning fork, they can convert that deformation, that displacement, into an electric current. And then you can detect the current. And the, the size of the signal tells you something about the amount of gas that's actually present. And what specifically the physicist was interested in is, could we uh, maximize the signal that we get out. So we've got a certain amount of that gas that we're interested in detecting present, like carbon dioxide. There's also noise, and so can you get as big of a signal out in the end um, as possible? And so what we were trying to do, so, so this is a picture of what's the standard tuning fork that he was using, which is a 32.8 kilohertz tuning fork. That's the resonance frequency of the tuning fork. And that's like the kind of tuning forks that are keeping time in your watch. So they're cheap, a couple dollars. Um, but there are other tuning forks on the market that you could use. And one of the things that we were interested in is if we change the geometry of the tuning fork, say the, the um, width of the tines or the length of the tines or the gap between them, would the signal be greater? And here's a picture that shows the, the result of the optimization study. So this is a picture of the stress the numerical stress that we solve for with the standard 32.8 kilohertz tuning fork. And here's a picture of the result of solving the optimization problem. And what you see is that it's maybe a little hard to see, but the main thing is the tines got really long and thin. And so if you remember the model, you shine the laser light in at the right frequency to excite the gas you're trying to detect. The gas molecules absorb that laser light, the uh, thermal wave, that is generated causes a heating of the tines of the tuning fork. They deform, they vibrate. And so the bigger the vibration of the tips of the tuning fork, the bigger the vibration of the tines, um, the bigger the signal ends up being. And so by making the tines longer and thinner, you get a bigger signal because the vibration happens more easily and it, more rapidly. And so this funny looking tuning fork gave us a 24 time bigger signal than the standard 32.8 kilohertz quartz tuning fork that was being used. And that's significant.